We would like to resume our regular Board of Education meeting. The time is 7-12. Roll call, please. Freitas? Nelson? Here. Grant? Here. Blackman? Here. Linares? Here. Corn. Here in a quorum is present. We're going to move to item number three, which are audience comments. We have two audience members who have signed up. Good evening. Everybody got me seen. I hear you fine. Sure. Um, my name is Gary Montvale. I am a resident of Baltimore. I have two daughters that went through District 161. Um, I was an active uh, facilitator for Green Team for Western Avenue, Parker, and a Village Green Commissioner. Um, I'm on the Southland Green Committee, and I'm also a sustainability coordinator for the Village Park Forest. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about the recycling. Um, people generate 4.4 pounds of garbage a day. Uh, 254 million pounds, uh, million tons of garbage are generated per year. Um, the U.S. produces 30% of the waste globally, whereas we only have 4% of the population. Um, studies show that schools, uh, school children um, produce 24% um, of, or approximately 24% of the school waste is recyclable, which is paper and cardboard. Um, the purpose of education is to uh, educate children to be um, responsible, productive, self-sustaining adults. And I think recycling is a fundamental responsibility. Everyone should take part of the waste stream that they produce. Um, Flossmore and Oakwood signed uh, Greenest Region contracts last year for Flossmore and this year for Homewood. And it is a itemized document on how to reduce your um, greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the many things that you can do is to educate your community, um, have your residential municipalities um, take care of their recycling and self-sustaining um, I have seen numbers that were quoted to the village as far as um, recycling bins. And it was quoted at 1,400 per month, which is $280 per dumpster if they were installed in each of the school buildings, uh, which is $16,800 per year. Um, I think that is a really high number that would, uh, would I work with home and disposal on my um, professional end, and that has to be either like a six yard dumpster that you're wanting to install at each of the facilities that I believe it's overkill at this point. Recycling hasn't been done in the school for a while. I propose to get three, um, they call them carts, but everyone knows as the medical with totes that you have like home side uh, residential. Those are $15 per month for service. And if you have three of them, it's $45 a month. That would be $2,700 a year for a recycling program to be started. And the biggest problem with recycling is contamination. A lot of the, what the school generates, like I said, is cardboard and paper. Uh, paper, you have the paper retrievers until that company is iffy. You never, I don't know how long it's gonna stay. Um, but just with the cardboard that's generated through the school district, if they're broken down, those totes would be fine. They would recycle empty um, caps on water bottles and any aluminum that is generated in um, the lounges or in the lunches. And that would be a great way to start. You wouldn't have to build new um, infrastructure as far as um, uh, enclosures, putting cement pavement down for that, and it would be easy to um, to implement. If it was very productive and you had to go through a two yard, then you can downsize your other regular waste container. It's all the same waste, it's just going two different directions and being responsible with it. Um, also, as far as the recycling bins, 
I believe it wouldn't be four or five thousand dollars to have recycling bins in all the classrooms. When I had children in this district and was active in the school, every classroom had a recycling bin then. That was, what, six years ago. Most of the classrooms still have recycling now, and even if they didn't, um, we could use cardboard boxes and signage until we did a fundraiser or um, if the school district didn't have money or PTO or something. There's easier solutions than to look at this huge um, $16,000 to implement recycling. So I am addressing you to rethink this situation. It's 2019, the climate is in stress and we need to be responsible with our race. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Yeah. If we were going to look for that chemical program, <coughs> Are there any municipalities or school districts that you can kind of point to and say they really haven't figured out right. from the logistical program? If you don't have to answer now, we can connect anytime. Yeah, yeah. I think, think they need some facts on that for sure. I would say Evanston is really good right now. Um, it just, you need faculty, you need like um, teachers, <coughs> a advocate. It's, kids will do it. And the best way we have found in experience is the first day of school. When the kids come in, they learn where their locker goes, where they have to you know, go to lunch. If they have a set thing where there's a garbage can and a recycle bin and you say, hey, class, this is your, all your homework or extra paper goes in this thing. It's, and cardboard is maintenance. Um, but I can get you those facts for sure. But that's a great place to start. Thank yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. The next community member we have who we have signed up is Pamela Abbott. Hi, uh, my name is Pamela Abbott and I am a paraprofessional over at Bossmore Hills um, and I also in pre and I also work with the green team there. So um, we're getting our green team up and running, got some fourth and fifth graders ready to um, take care of the environment and um, we need some help because um, it's just hard to do it, you know, all on your own in um, during the recess period. So that's that's really hard. Um, they want to pick up litter. They want to recycle, and um, it's just great that they they have the enthusiasm, you know, to want to care. And, um, I also came across. Um, an article in a magazine. This this was in um, I don't even know if I can pronounce the place, but it's in Honduras, and they have um, a school there. And each day, the children pick up trash around the campus, learning to take ownership and pride in their space. And it is an exercise and a mindset to practice in an environment um, that is heavily polluted. So, um, in other parts of the world, students are trying their best, you know, to work with more difficult situations than what we have. And, um, you know, sometimes our um, extra garbage, you know, uh, kind of gets us looking in the wrong place for things when it can be a lot simpler, like Carrie was mentioning. You know, <clears throat> just the practice, the mindset, starting from the children. Um, you know, we, we sort of try to get the kids thinking about, um, you know, what do we throw away? Like, look around your school, what, what do we throw away, and what can we avoid throwing away? And, um, you know, one of the things were the things in the lunchroom, like the fruit cups and the milk cartons, um, for instance. There's cardboard trays, there's so many things. Um, in the classrooms, there's markers and there's glue sticks. Um, so, if we know what we're throwing away, then it'll be a lot easier to deal with the bigger picture. So starting with the small in the schools and finding out, well, what are we throwing away and what can we divert? Like Carrie was saying, you know, everything doesn't have to go in one place, the trash. Um, and we're paying for that. And we're probably paying more than we have to pay for that because we could be reusing a lot of that. So it's just like the mindset and you know the children in Honduras they, they inspire me and um, 
I just, I just um, think that there's a lot of hope and possibility. And one more thing, um, before I came here, um, I started looking up elementary schools that have recycling programs, which was a good thing that you said, because looking at what's out there, we don't have to act alone. Sometimes there's already examples out there. So um, there are a lot of different I ideas. Um, some good articles which I could pass anybody's way um, to start a recycling program at, at our schools. Thank you for my scattered thoughts. I appreciate it. <laughs> very close proximity to us that there are school districts that routinely do no waste lunches and have children that are creating these all this problem. So this is just, it's a hurdle that we have to address for, for the benefit of our whole community, not because of the cause. So this could be the first part of that conversation, but I'll follow with both of you so that we can continue moving forward if that's fair. Do we need to have more else on that subject?
So we are going to skip around just for a second based on Pam's very smart request. Um, and we do have a recycling program on the agenda for discussion, so maybe we can talk about that now and then go back to our committee reports. I think the information is already been spelled yeah. out. You know, we were asked to get the cost of putting out the dumps of recycled over storage building. It's an additional fourteen hundred dollars a month. Um, I, I'm all for trying to start something smaller if we can. I mean, I don't. We're not opposed to recycle by any stretch of the imagination, but I don't know what that looks like. And we, you know, without some proposal, I, I don't know how to cost it for you. So. I mean, I, I guess in my opinion, I would love to kick it back to you guys and say, give us something more specific other than we need to recycle, and, and we can we can work with it. But I, I think you know at this point, sixteen thousand eight hundred is a lot of money. We said maybe this is our first step, and let's really let's mobilize some kids and, and get their brain power moving and find out what we can do. We do have a lot of people who are focused on recycling our green team. Teacher sponsors are really committed, and so I know between them, the students and the parents, we come up with a solution that we haven't thought of yet. But Fran and I really wanted to make sure we were serious about this, and so you know, as Fran spent her time, especially during the levy and budget process, it's all taken away from something. But we want to make sure that we have a clear understanding of what our commitment could be. So now we have one piece of information. We can go out and figure out what the other pieces are, and figure out what our best solution is. I have a second a lot of comments that, so when I saw this memo, right, I, you know, I think I came here going to use 16 grand for a second. Especially when um, we have no idea where that stuff's going, because that would be really, you know, we could be paying 16, 17 grand for them to just throw the stuff in the dump anyways, because we have no idea what to do with it. So, um, you know, uh, I, do, I, I do like the idea of getting, um, you know, starting with something simple like cardboard for smaller money. Um, which is easier in case you're not looking at it. It's um, the other issue is, you know, if we do invest money in this, we want to make sure that it's not going to a landfill. Like, you know, we have this paper program with Avid TV or whatever we call it. We really have to do the rest of it. Um, it's not costing us anything, which is great, but I'm not really convinced we even know what's happening to it. Are those dumpsters at each of the schools? The green and yellow? Yes. And are they utilized one or? Yes, they are. In fact, the community knows they're there too, so I've seen um, uh, people come and drop newspapers off, you know, big stacks of newspapers off in them. So they get filled up probably once a month. Every class has a recycling bin and then the picks it up every week and I mean the custodian helps them and the green team leaders help them and it's a large amount they take out every week. Can you track them? Ask them where they send it. How about the can the green team uh, you know <laughs> so, I mean paper seems like the easiest way you know mm -hmm. oh, yeah. so working at law office right I fill up the garbage can full of paper and they so that mm -hmm. But it's easy looking for, I would, and then, you know, I don't know um, how transparent home disposal is about what they're doing and stuff. But um, we don't have confidence in the existing paper recycling program and home disposal, you know, and we're going to be paying home disposal some small amount anyways. Maybe we should be sitting right there. But, you know, it depends on what they tell you what they're doing. Okay. These are all things that we can do. Well, I, I, I just want to say that I think that um, what both of you were discussing was great. Uh, I am in full support of anything that actually is environmentally uh, beneficial. And so I also am really happy to see that you took the time to write the entire board about your ideas. Um, I think that we actually have a, a very vibrant um, community that actually is in, really um, embraces um, environmental assistance of topics, and that we're being, you know, be remiss if we can find a way to allow them to, to come up with ideas to help. And I think it's really terrific to allow children to also give ideas on how to do it. Um, 
I'm not trying to tell the administration how to do this, but I think that there are ways we can let the administration do this with the children and the community actually present it back. And I bet we get some terrific ideas that won't cost the money we present. Yes, ma'am. I would like to state that homeless disposal, we've visited many years in a row and checked out the facility, and it is legit. Um, so they're not, that is a misconception that we heard, so that's why we asked to go visit. So I do think it's important to realize that the locally owned business that is legit. I do have my qualms with activity because it was years ago that those bins were put in place. I don't know what the status is now. From what I understand, that company is disfunct. They, 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 I think they went under, and I don't know what the status is. Okay. So if anyone was going to consider anything, homeway disposal would be who we tried to get. I would imagine I came in late to at least get some general recy curbside recycling that the kids see at home. I also want just to mention that, um, you know, it's not just so much about the environment, but we ask our kids to practice good character and by recycling and taking care of their building and being good to the earth is a great way for young children to demonstrate what kind of citizens they are. So I think it is really important. A lot of good lessons. But I agree, $16,000 is a lot of money. So I would wonder how much just a couple of totes that would just take the basics, which would be paper, cardboard, and um, probably just aluminum would be your start, and plastic. But it is legit. Home disposal, we've visited many times. And I like the part about grants, you know, getting stuff. Grant, that was really, yeah. yeah. I, I just feel like this conversation is pretty old, though. We've been doing this. We are one of the few districts that have held it to the higher level, and I think that it's something that really takes us apart from most districts in the Chicagoland area. So just having the first side recycling like they have at their homes is not asking that much, especially if it's just a couple totes, because I understand why we want to take it slow and make sure it doesn't end up to be garbage. Because putting food and stuff is not okay. And to add that, so in Chicago Heights, um, we get a yard waste that's different though, which is residential. So I wonder if they would give, it's a new piece of public services, if they would give to yard waste, I'm sorry, uh, recycling totes to us just because we're in Chicago Heights and they're doing it for residents. So, I mean, that's another option to look into. I know we're contracted to, you know, so it sounds like there's more homework to do, um, but we are obviously very committed to doing more. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to go back to item five, which are is our committee report for the learning and instruction committee. Well, Ken? Yeah. Any particular thoughts? We, we talked a little bit about uh, one of the issues that we're having at the elementary level, which is about fifth grade acceleration. Um, we have fifth graders moving into sixth grade. Now. We are restricted on who can teach that class, which we are using Elevate currently. And I know we have a meeting scheduled with our parents, fifth grade parents, to talk about that. We have students at Western and at Heather Hills. So uh, we think we have a good solution to move forward. We really need to make sure we have the rigor in place for that program. So we talk a little bit about what that looks like and what we can expect coming down the pipeline as far as future years and acceleration is concerned. Okay. Uh, and and I, I'm, I wasn't at the meeting, but I'm having a hard time trying to understand what the minutes say. Okay. So that's why I'm trying to listen very attentively to what you're saying. Could you go back again to number three and say, so what's space and rigor? What is that? And then one or two. So there's a so one of the numbers. We have to right? What is the position? <coughs> no, all right. So obviously, you know, one and two were welcome in. Um, Number three was our the fifth grade acceleration. There's two main issues: space and rigor. And the spaces, you know, 
how we run the program. It's virtual, but we still have space issues. Uh, we are out of classrooms at Western American School. There are no more classrooms. And so when it comes down to getting a group of students together that are outside of the core group, we struggle. Um, we don't have that problem at Heather Hill. And so the Heather Hill option is taking a class, the student from Western Avenue to Heather Hill for the elevated K-12 acceleration class. So under the rigor is sharing information around the scope and sequence and how it aligns. Uh, to that, to, to our current sixth grade math course, and then homework is always an issue, and that came from a number of different parents. This is not an exhaustive list. I know that uh, Mrs. Isabella has a number of different things that she's captured from parents that she'll share at the, the meeting. I know that Ms. Crawford is working on that as well. So I know that, do you have a date for that? Um, we believe Wednesday. Right, so I'll, I'll probably hop into that. Not to make a joke. Hop into that virtually. No, with uh, the parents, mm -hmm. because that would be in Springfield. Uh, so I made Google Hangout, which I don't, maybe I'd run here. Nope. <laughs> I do a Google Hangout for maybe a zero, right? Uh, so just to talk to you. At our most recent board meeting, we talked about policies. We, we started with policy 610, which was really the perspective as a, as a board and I feel about education and what's, what's important. So, our current 610, this, the adopted policy 610 versus the current recommended language is night and day. And so we figured that would be a good place to start uh, versus what is in press. So Cam and Carolyn have access to all the, the press documents. We're actually going to bring, going to bring that philosophy statement to the NI team at their next meeting next Thursday. And so bring that back to the instruction team after But, you know, there's a lot of different policies that would be the best one to start with, especially as the strategic plan is getting up and running. And then, you know, finally, reviewing MTSS and special ed. Just what that process looks like, appoint a person for tier three, et cetera. Um, talk a little bit about special education data and how, how do we share that information most effectively. And finally, we talked about common, form, common formative assessments at our most recent board meeting. A number of board members expressed interest in doing more for our grade level transitions. And so we briefly talked about fifth to sixth grade, but also eighth grade to high school. We're going to add all, new, all the things that we currently do because we really do a lot for those transitions. And, and so it, we'd be remiss if we didn't identify everything that we do from fifth to sixth but also from six to high school. So we're gonna add all those pieces and bring it back to the learning instruction team at 530.
who were focused primarily on special education. And, and the discussion really focused in on, you know, so what's working and what's not working with the multi-year system of support. And um, because we have Robin there, we're going to make real time talking about the transition from, you know, tier how tier three to transition to special ed or vice versa, um, special ed back to general education and whether those systems are really working well. Um, I think that they all need to work better. Uh, but my personal take, and this ties back to the policy of the 610, which is um, we have to be careful not to let policy override good decision making with individual students. So the question we were asking surrounding um, NTSS and special ed was, you know, are we doing a good job of tracking those, you know, who, who's the champion for that kid as they go through the process? Are they, you know, if you're a tier three student and you're spending a good chunk of your time with, you know, with a tier three specialist, for example, and then you, you know, you have, you have, you have, you know the kid trusts that person, right? And then they don't make their targets and they move into special ed and lose contact and, and who's their consistent um, contact there. And, and that, of course, is part of what we're trying to address and we've talked many times about whether part of their schedule probably needs to adjust coming into uh, contract discussions because we have limitations on what we can do in those kids. So a middle school model where the team can help focus on individual kids and people can do that that kid can have a more consistent contact um, was part of our discussion. Hoping that will improve um, But if you have suggestions for things you want us to ask them. But I, I was just going to add that, in addition to looking at policy, one of the things that our first meeting is that, that what that we looked at the data that shows a significant gap, and I think we also said that we wanted just different gaps, socioeconomic gaps, gaps around race, gender. So one of the things we said we wanted to look at was that. But what you see here is kind of things that have come up that have also caused us to pause and turn on like the elevate situation. Accelerated kids. So I think it's kind of a mix of both while we sort through some of the things that need immediate attention and at least conversation. And then, which in my mind, the big pieces are the policy, which should drive practice, but a little bit can distract, but then also the gaps that we have, achieving gaps. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it'll take this first year to figure out sort of what the idea be and purpose of this committee is I just want to make sure um, it doesn't become a dumping ground for everything that we don't have time to have in-depth conversations here and they you go they get dumped over there because it's very very easy to um, not have time to address the goals that you originally set up to do so um, so I mean so we'll just keep you know hearing updates and seeing I mean I think um, the policy piece is huge, um, but I also think the NTSS is urgent. And it's very, it's now, um, so that definitely requires um, more attention. Um, you know, and then you can decide about the science piece, you know, um, but certainly if it starts to feel like it just, you know, stuff's being dumped into that committee, um, then we should think about, you know, what makes sense to come off. Sure. I think that as it's evolving, we'll end up with it. So both MTSS and then achievement gap data, I mean, all, all of that comes back to, um, we need to focus on those students who are struggling and, and give them appropriate, you know, intervention to get them where we want them to be, right? So, and, and then, but all these discussions tie into some of our community work, right? So, you know, I have my thoughts on how I draft policy, but we have a whole team working on a strategic plan, and those two things need to combine. Achievement back gap discussions have a lot to do with our equity and inclusion committee. Um, and so, I think that um, as we get a little more robust discussion about that, we can bring uh, the revised version of 610 to you guys. But, um, you know, I agree that. You know, we're pretty, you know, the focus should be final time results and then individual students who need that help are probably going to be the most Okay. 
All right, a quick question. Um, did you guys get a chance to flush out the recommendations in the MTSS report? We talked on a subset of that, related to specifically the transition from MTSS to special ed. We did not have a long, expansive discussion about the entire report. It's much to try off in that meeting. So what's the point about the recommendation of the report? On uh, special ed? Um, well, there are multiple recommendations. So I'll yeah. just, it, again, so, it's, a, it's, it's a lot. That's all I'm asking. Um, the plan to do for and what we're doing, but I mean, it really comes down to executing. I mean, the, 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 as you noted in prior meetings, right, the report says all the right words, but are we really carrying out? Um, I think we've just been going in our past discussion that you know, um, we might not be carrying out. Um, I think it's also fair that maybe we're not presenting some of the growth data very well because we have students that are growing. Um, and some of those might be going to support performance in prior years. But it's, it's got to come down to paying very close attention to things like I was talking about. Like, so if a student is struggling, um, you know, people in the building have to be able to be practical. I have a sense that's tough to do with part two that we um, And if you look, look on, so the, the elementary um, sample there for the cognitive formative assessment mm -hmm. So um, that strikes me as, um, that's okay. It's, it's just a spreadsheet where you can track of how each individual student it's one to go through data. How each individual student is performing, right, in the school, right? So it's a sort of part of the principal dashboard and, and the administration dashboard. And, um, you know, we kind of that during the last meeting, right? But that's what we need to see happening, right? We can't wait for high schoolers. We need to be satisfied. And I think this is happening, I think, most of the building. But we need to be satisfied that everyone in the building is focused on all of this, right? This is in 100% on all the pre tests We need to find something more challenging for that. This kid hits 12% on the first assessment. He's struggling in class. You know, what are our interventions? Who's going to take the lead with them? Who can take ownership over this child? And so, um, I believe this is the, I don't want to overstate it. This is the first time we've ever done this. I think individual principals have done this, but um, as a district, right, they all have this. Uh, miles going forward, so I have some comfort that progress is being made, um, but there's not some new procedure that we're doing. It's all, it's mostly we really need to focus on executing on all subjects. Yeah, it's just for, for me when I see like we paid money for the report, and the report had recommendations, and so the recommendations are answers. You know, we'd be remiss if we didn't go ahead and use those answers for improvement. And that's kind of how I ask questions. You know, so it's, it's not like I want to tear apart, and I'm not going to tear apart this whole report. But if there's stuff in there that we can actually use to actually move us forward, I'm saying it's not, it's just committed where it goes, and have we actually, to use the, the, the word of the day, have we unpacked it? I think the word is to decide the priorities, right? Because it's, Everything's fine, including time. And so I, I think, you know, to Michelle's point, we're gonna, we're gonna, maybe set goals, we're gonna accomplish those goals. The day expired, this is absolutely the right committee to put those things into because we'll have the bandwidth to focus on those. The question is, you know, what are the things that are most important once you have a strategic plan? Then all of that goes into your learning instruction. Committee, right? Because I'm, I'm digging around, you know, obviously we're building our way through committees, but essentially what we've added is four, you know, four additional committees of the whole. Typically when you have committees, you get rid of your committee of the whole, and you move to all the action meetings, and everything kind of runs through those committees, and they're pretty heavy hitting. And so we're, we're chunking, you know, the finance committee hits recycling and all of those different pieces that, that, that we would have talked about in open session, and they kind of run through the so, you know, to David's point, I think as we get a laser focus on what we want to accomplish, then you don't have to wonder, where does MTSS fall? Right? Which pieces are 1920, which are 2021, which may be 22, 23, just because of how we've decided to use our time. So, I think 
Has the committee finished going through that document? No, not as a group. No. So, um, so it still sits there. And um, I think it would be helpful. Um, certainly, I think if that could be a priority, just so you can at least put it on some sort of time line um, in terms of what can be implemented or executed better or you know, however, whatever terminology you use mm -hmm. for this school year versus next school year. Because we are early enough in this school year um, to be able to utilize that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we are. Yeah, but, so um, we did talk a little bit about the special ed section, like Kim said, and some of those things have been already addressed like, from the beginning, as soon as this report got in the ground. And so some of those, so we did, we did kind of go through this with a little detail. So I, um, rather than allow, we had space to ask specifically, it says that we need this. Is this happening? Yes or no? So we did do that. Actually, Courtney, um, if you could go to board docs and refresh the okay. page I uploaded, uh, just a small snippet of it. So this is one minuscule, oh, right. you know, screenshot of a multi-tabbed complex spreadsheet will track all of our, this is uh, math. So it's tracking sensitive data by unit and chapter. And we have that for math and literacy, and then the teachers are working together and say, okay, here's what we do. Now, there's, there's the benefit within the school. All the fourth grade teachers can get together. Here's how we thought it would go. Here's how it actually went. What do you want to do, do differently? But also, as we move through the year, we can say, okay, let's get all of our fourth grade teachers together across the district. Here's what you thought would happen, here's what you thought, here's what actually happened, and what are we missing, where do we want to be? Maybe it's a content issue, maybe it's a training issue. But what better, what better ability to respond to these the students and the teachers as we sensitively track the data? So, I can share the whole thing with you, but this is just a keep it piece that I always feel like gets lost um, when we start talking about this, and not because we're not addressing it, um, is the role that parents play in this. It's just so, I just feel like there is a disconnect. There's something in the system um, um, uh, fails to connect parents to what's happening on a regular basis. Um, and so parents are able to advocate effectively because we aren't even really sure what we're advocating for or what, I mean, so, you know, it, it, it's, I feel like the responsibility is on the parent to actually figure out what's going on. You're talking and about that in general. general. And so I feel like we talked communication. About, well, we talked about that, but I don't. Are you talking about for parents who really need to focus in on the needs of the students? I think that if you have a child who is receiving intervention, right. then the parent needs to focus in on right. their kid. And, and what my own personal experience is, I don't have enough information, and unless I am asking for it, sure. and unless I am requesting a meeting, I am absolutely clueless about what's going on. So, I agree with you. And echo that, and uh, I think I'm, I'm waiting a little bit to hear what Dana and Amabel and the rest of the team want to recommend for accomplishing this year on that front. You know, my personal gripe, it, it's not just a gripe, it's that I, I think it's really important. The speed of information and accurate information doesn't seem to exist in the public. It's not, the, the, the flow is not good, right? And so, one of my own students, right, you know, I found out over the weekend, he's got like five assignments missing. The dates of those assignments are back in August. I'm like, why am I, why is this being in today? I suppose. Literally a month later, I'm finding out that the assignment is supposed to be missing. He's telling me he did it. I've talked to parents. 
who are photographing their assignments because they have so little trust in their teachers actually not losing them, but they're photographing them before they get turned in. Um, I had a robotic student tell me yesterday, how's school going? He's like, oh, it's great. Um, you know, usually this time we have one, 15 or 20 assignments missing, but you know, I'm only out of eight this week. <laughs> this is like, this is like one of my favorite students, one of the smartest kids I know. I'm like, are you serious? So, um, and that's not, you know, so we're missing a, that, that communication chain with parents somehow. I mean, it's, I find it frustrating, you know, um, that, that I don't get assignments. There's another anecdote would be like, if you're, you, if hey, yes, that's right. The kid gets like a D on a test, and then they're like, oh, well, let's go over a test. And they're like, we won't give you the test. Like, that to me is the, the, the greatest uh, move in the wrong direction that, you know, um, so both of the, so, so for an involved parent, it's frustrating, right? How can a parent who's not that involved keep track of what they're just doing if that information's not flowing? And in the old days, we just had worksheets that came home. Everything was on paper, and it was easier, and the kids just brought it home, and at least once a week, you like, let me see what they did. Now we're doing digital. I have no idea what they're doing. And if I'm lucky, I find out if an assignment got missed, I find out weeks afterwards. And I don't know what their grades are. I can't see what answers they got wrong. So that's a problem that we as an organization need to fix. But um, as a committee level, we haven't really built into it. But I, sure. You know, one of the things that I, I want to bring out is that um, I'm always trying to make sure that we're not, you know, uh, system schools, school, the school system. And so um, I witnessed with my, my children, that what they're now doing is that certain teachers, and this is why I hope that we can get some consistency, are trying to do things where they're actually trying to communicate, which I agree with 100% is communication, We're trying to involve the parents by communicating, offering them the information. And so this teacher is throwing it at us, like, here it is. And this is what the assignment not only has been, but will be for next week. And so there's actually a before and an after, there's a snapshot that you can get. And then another teacher is kind of doing the same thing, but they're, they're doing it digitally. And so there is involvement, but is that, I cannot say whether that's happening system-wide, whether it's happening in public school, if that's teacher by teacher. And so I think that that's something that has to be kind of worked out with the administration to make sure that there's some, you know. Well, we can't, we also can't, Forget that as a board we approve the new what is it what is it called yeah, the new camp, yeah, right? but we have kind of a delay now because e chalk is gone and so if parents did use that as a way to connect that's gone completely and so you, you will find that a good number of us are in the dark when it comes to what's happening on a regular basis or even on a monthly basis because that tool is missing. But to your point, Michelle. Um, I, I mean, we can just keep saying it. Parents need to know if their kid is struggling. <coughs> Quickly, immediately, yesterday, and, and what, how they can partner with the school, if they're available to do so, how can they help do what the school is trying to do? And, and I would say it's our middle 60%. Some of the high kids and some of the students who need intervention, it's those kids right in the middle of our classrooms and our grade levels that turn in their assignments, they turn in their work, they never show up on any, any report for discipline or anything like that, but they could have means where if we get out in front of them early, we have the parents in, now that's not a need anymore, and they're on their, they're just not their way. So I, I hear everything that you're saying on the information point, and we've, got, we've talked with our building principals about this. Okay, thank you. We uh, have one item under item six for consent agenda. Oh. Oh, sorry, just, no, no, no. Uh, can I have a motion, please, to approve the personnel report as presented? So moved. Second. Any questions or concerns? Roll call, please. Nelson? Yes. Blackman? Yes. Leedstra? Yes. Lanier? Gray? Yes. Horth? Yes. The motion was passed. Just to draw attention to it, we, with that action, we approve Assistant Principal for Western Avenue School. <coughs> Mrs. Jack Larenko is here.
Right? I wasn't sure, so I did. And I'm not going to see them. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Flossman community, the school district, and the Board of Education for this incredible opportunity. Dr. Smith and Ms. Crawford, thank you for your continued support and trust. To Mrs. Isabelli, the Western staff, students, and parents, I am so ready to join your pack. I'm sorry. <laughs> Last but not least, to the three most important men in my life, my husband and my sons, thank you for your unwavering love and support, for believing in me, sometimes more than I believe in myself, and for being my biggest cheerleader. Sebastian and Kane, thank you for motiva motivating me and inspiring me to be the best I can be. Thank you. Congratulations. This record will be absolutely fantastic to watch her. The, the school is here, just an amazing human being. She's a great practitioner too. She's just a wonderful person. She works really hard. As you can see, she brings the type of emotion and care that, that we need for our children that we want to treat like our very well. So, Sorry, yeah. I tried to not. No, no, you're good. <laughs> Never apologize for that. We appreciate it. So, congratulations. Thank you. I do it all the time. Yeah, you see it's all right.
Jeff told me there's another seven drivers that are currently in the behind the wheel portion, but that's system-wide, not just for us. When you say system-wide, you mean system-wide for Illinois school? Oh, it's Coke, Illinois. So, hypothetically, if we were to go to the bus company, we potentially wouldn't be having this problem? No, it's systemic. It's the whole, it's everything. And I don't know, so we're gonna go out to bid. I'm gonna prepare you right now. There is an extraordinarily good chance that we only have one bid because nobody else has the fleet to handle another another company. Um, it was, he was telling me this morning, one of the Joliet school systems can't find enough drivers to handle their own fleet, so they were starting to look and see which of the companies could handle them, and none of them are, are stepping up because they don't have the ability to. Chris, how, how many schools are we talking about? On the band or I don't know. I mean, because remember, we're taking from the four buildings and bringing to Parker. I mean, I think it's it's historically been one bus that we've used for each elementary and sometimes two at Western Ave. <coughs> so it's about students filling the buses. Not necessarily. No, it depends on the building. More than 100 students. 80 to 100. So it's 80 to 100. <laughs> and. You're saying that last year we had buses. Last and year right. we were limping along trying to fill the need, but not very well. But we had buses and drivers. We, have not had buses. Yes. Yeah. we did not have buses and drivers. We had some drivers on certain days, depending on what else was going on, and sometimes they were putting the manager behind the school bus to try and make it happen. And a lot of times, the kids were sitting in a hallway waiting from a quarter to three until 3.30 until a bus got there. No yeah. yeah. So uh, this year? This year we haven't even started anything because right now I can tell you I don't have a driver to make it happen. I mean, 45 minutes you can walk up Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Have we in that base? Yeah. Have we, and, and I know this was some um, really don't blame. Have we talked to the parents about this to see if they want to do some type of carpooling thing? At this point, not to my knowledge. I mean, at least not for my, my department, we haven't. Um, I, I will tell you too, though, I do know what like, Portland was doing it the way we were. They just switched up this year and they went to zero hour for the exact same reason. They can't get the kids there. So ultimately, the parents, if they have students in band, are going to be patient for choice of uh, mm -hmm. finding ways to get their kids there at, at 245 or doing it more. What would the zero hour look like then? What, what, give me the time and the frame is there. Probably if you're going to get any kind of decent. So in my mind, it looks like probably 645. And then at 730, they could get on the bus going to their elementary school when Parker students get dropped off. And just get brought to their own. So 645 at Parker. Mm -hmm. wow. but, but, is, but part of the ban is that the fifth and sixth grade would play together, right? That's part of it. So this would just be fifth grade. So you would, before you would have six, sixth grade do zero hour two. Mm -hmm. So, so why does six play together? I Honestly, I don't know much about the fourth and fifth. Fourth and fifth. So it doesn't they go to the Parker, Parker, they go to Parker just to rehearse. I feel like there are some activities with the sixth grade band because they are the beginning band. How many they, rehearsals are we talking? Honestly, I, mean, I don't know much about Every Monday. Monday. Mm -hmm. So once a week? Once a week. Once a week for band, once a week for us. Right. Once a week for target. Once a week for each band and orchestra. Twice a week they have to be. No, band and, and orchestra goes in. Yeah, no, you're right. Different days. Different days. Yeah. Why did they go to park? Why can they, and is there a reason they can't? We looked at that too because of the equipment that would have to be transported. It's significant, and there's no place to store a lot of them in the elementary. And you have to cart them from elementary to elementary back to park. But, and I know it's not it's a lot, but is it easier to cart equipment versus children? But you still have the, the, your, your fourth grade band, your orchestra, now separate your class from the yes, the you know, practice yeah. sides. Yeah. You know, yeah. Practice in one place. Well, I feel like our conversation was on the right track. Everything that you guys are talking about, we have been wrestling. Right? 
And the one little sliver that we haven't addressed here is equity. Right? So if we say, hey, we're going to roll over to that's excellent. What about those families who can't get there? Or don't, or don't have connections? We don't, we don't want to have those students miss out as well. I think that's really why we're trying to find a solution that keeps kind of transportation in our hands so parents don't have to worry about it. Um, but that we can get kids to to practice together. But, you know, it's also beginning band and orchestra. And so I think as we talk about the expectations for the program and how much joint district-wide practice time is needed in a, a school, 500 children. I think that's where we, we may have to make some adjustments as well because the expectations of time in a district this size with everyone practicing the other can be shown. No, yeah, the problem is still at the same 45 a.m. What is it? What about the back end? It's plus. Plus at 6 p.m. Oh. After school. Yeah. Like no, no, no. The heater at 6 p.m. You put there at 6 there's I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand your question, Misha. So, so instead of being in the morning at 645, why can't they all practice at two, after school? That's the issue right now. It's trying to get a two part like right 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 right. I mean, we can't so, we, so we can't get them there until they, so we have, we have two stacked routes in the afternoon. We have Parker at 232, 235. Parker 15, I mean, uh, runs their route. They're paired with Heather Hill, eight, right? So then they go to Heather Hill, and then they run that route, and now they're free. So technically, they can swing back to Heather Hill. Exactly. Yeah. So you'd be right. looking at it's probably the earliest 3:45, or realistically 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to convince the take-home kids route and open up one bus strictly to take the kids from. We've consolidated so tight right now that that's causing some of the problems that I'm having at Western Avenue. We actually opened up an additional route in the afternoon and took kids off of two separate Parker afternoon routes and made another Parker afternoon route just to try and get the buses back to Western Avenue in time. And, and by on time, I mean we're trying to make it there by 3.15 and dismissal is 3.05. So we've consolidated so much the problem is the amount of time that we have between when those Parker kids get picked up and the last one gets dropped off and then getting back to the school. We just we don't have the room to do it. Not, it the afternoon is just too tight. Do we have a room? We do, and they're driving kids at the exact same time. They're picking them up from the elementary schools and they're bringing them home. So, but, uh, and to answer your question, I was going to ask the exact same question. So, what if we got another bus? Another mini bus? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I don't think your mini bus is going to fit the number of kids that you need to find. I mean, we've already said we're coming, you know, I mean, those mini buses, you know, they're good for 23 kids. You have full bus, and then? And then you have all the instruments and, the, and their backpacks, and the kids are not small. Right. Yet. You're going to need a whole fleet of mini buses. So, why, why, what is the downside of having a consolidated, a district wide? consolidated practice once a week at Parker versus the kids just having practice in the afternoon at their own schools. You're asking the business person you probably <laughs> don't want my business. Uh, it's, it's the issue of the uh, instruments is what we're running to. Well, but where are the instruments at? Parker. So how do the students practice during the week at school? What do you guys think? No, 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 yeah. Right. Okay, what is your question? My question is, why do we have to have a consolidated practice once a week at Parker? Why can't kids just stay at their own school not one teacher? and play well, and practice? Because they are, and it's, it's both well, but the, the thing world is, for being at Parker. They do have lessons at the individual school. Yeah, but they don't have, there's no, there's no performance on a district-wide level that includes yes, all the four. Yes, there is. Yeah. Yeah. It's the beginning band, yeah. Yes, there is. Is it just a ball of me? Yes, there is. It's a big concert. 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 That's why I want to start with the sixth grade. It's kind of the same thing that the HF does with the arts and the eighth graders and the sixth graders and the fifth graders. A little bit of mentoring. No, no, I'm saying, yeah. But with, with the zero hour, there's no bus. You're not, you're not 
So, so you're, what the, the suggestion would be then if parents, so right now, if we bring, the parents bring, or sorry, the buses bring to Parker, and then the parents bring to Parker. Right. This way would be reversed. The parents would be responsible to bring to Parker at the very early hour of the morning. But then you would bus them that. from Parker back to their elementary, because remember, when Parker drops off their students, that bus now turns into an elementary run, so just get on the right bus. Would that work? Sure. I think that's real good, but it's the equity issue of who can be yeah. And so it may be a little bit easier as, as we talk. It's one thing to drop off earlier and then go to work. It's another thing to, I can't go out to work at home. We don't have a way home, so I, we can't do that activity. Yeah. So it may, it may, even if I'm close to Yeah, I mean, I guess when I put on my mom hat, it'd be a whole lot easier for me to drop my child off in the morning and make sure I can be there for a while. Yeah. Our commitment is our commitment is anti a strong parents program. And this is part of that, and coming up with the solution that's going to support the teachers and the kids. Hey, look, we're the ones that say yes. Do band and orchestra. I don't care. Play every instrument. Which causes even more problems for us. But <laughs> frankly, at the elementary level, it's hard to tell a child no when they're excited about trying a different different instrument or different you know hobby those sorts of things. So we're trying to figure out every solution that we can to get as many kids involved. So what? So what? What is it that you guys are going to continue to brainstorm with some in the back? Well, regardless, the band program is in a long way. They will still play. Oh, yeah. The, yeah. the band program can't go away. No, no I'm just okay. Okay. Our team is still, right. They're still going to get to practice at their individual Right. I mean, to be clear, if nobody has said anything about doing away with, with the program. We are all 100% support right. the music program. I just can't get them there. I'm not, I, I don't want to promise them something and not be able to produce. And I can't promise it. It's, it's not there. I've got the regional vice president telling me I cannot get you a bus. I would like to say you I would also be trying to elicit the information from the parents. When is this supposed to start? This week. I think later on this week. Yeah, um, so, whatever solution is decided upon for this school year. Um, obviously, it's not the permanent solution. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. I don't know. I guess my point is, is that we can't be in October of next year trying to figure out how to solve the bands and orchestra problem. No, you'll have this. Well, I would consider whatever decision we have in the next month is for the next seven. And then somewhere around April or March, we're talking about what it's going to be like. Yeah. I, I will also say this. I talked to Jeff this afternoon. He's sending me a posting. I'm going to put them up in all the buildings. If any parents want to make some money in the afternoon, you'll get their CDL. Yeah. And yeah. they can come and, and drive our bus. So we're going to put those up in every day. He was more than happy to, to give us that information. We'll put it on our social media. And I, and I know that this is my life, and that's one of the transportation. One of the things that we've talked about in a big picture sense, which gets going to the strategic plan, is with the transportation, when does it become more economical for us to have our own school? Mm -hmm. But it's never more economical. So I'm, I'm not trying to have that conversation. They're not done right now. It's done. Because when you, you know, we can't get drivers, right? So then now all of a sudden, <coughs> Those drivers are somewhere around thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars each. So, and I'm making that at the bus companies, but that's what you have to pay. And then <coughs> there's insurance, the mechanics, you know, all, all of those things that we don't have now. Mechanics, a full-time transportation coordinator, because this girl can't do that. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's never more economic. You may have to have more control. I think so. That's what you're trading, um, which may be better. You know, but, yeah. <laughs> So that's where we're at. Yeah. So do you think you'll bring this back in two weeks? Sure. I don't know that we have a choice. We're gonna have to make a decision. And, and, okay. and right now what I'm getting from the bus company is buses at 2 30, 3 o'clock are not gonna happen. So we're gonna have to come up with another solution. So it's about an hour before 8.45 a.m. Yeah. Absent any magical ideas or, you know, poor parents getting their CDL system. Right. I mean, and, and 
maybe, depending on what happens, maybe that campaign, I mean, it would take them a while, obviously, to get a license and those kinds of things. Um, and then we can see how many, and Jeff was telling me, you know, he's got seven that are behind the wheel right now. He said, expect a couple of them will drop and we won't, they call seven won't go to fruition. But I don't know what that might look like next semester. Maybe we're dealing with it in one way this semester and, and something different next. Maybe we don't want to make a change in the middle of the year. I don't know. We're going to have to talk to the players continue those potential yeah. conversations. But right now, there's just no way I can get them there this week. No. So we'll reach out to the teachers. Right. So, one of the things we talked about now, can we offer an incentive to the parents to get their CDL? Uh, at that point, they would be agents employees, not ours. Now, I am assured that they love PM only drivers. Anyone who wants to work from one to four, they love them. But, and you know, you can make some money, but you know, that would be with Coke and no. I didn't know. Okay. Except? First, I have done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, second one, let's see, 15 seconds or less. The administrator and teacher salary and benefits report. I don't know why, but the, we are required to put this report up on our website, and for whatever reason, the school code says that I need to present it to you, so consider it presented. You do not have to vote on it, you do not have to approve it. I just have to present it to you in formal session before it gets put on the website, so congratulations to the presenter. Yeah, <laughs>
That was the way it was designed to be done in the beginning. So, the taxing body would then get increased revenue every time the property value was increased, right? So if your $10,000 property increased to $12,000 worth of value, you had 20% increase in your property value, you also would have a 20% increase in your property tax. That was that. Then came PTOP, otherwise known as the tax cap, property tax extra limitation, okay? So Cook County prop taxes don't work like this anymore because of PTOP. So let's go on to the assessment process first. So the assessment states, the state law states, that all properties are supposed to be assessed at one third of their fair market value. Except for Cook County, of course. Um, and it, starting in 2009, the new classification system actually simplified this because there used to be many more classifications, but now there's two classifications and you're either at 10% or 25%. The residences are at 10%, also commercial res commercial property are at 25%. Cook is assessed, you heard the triennial, so it's done in three pieces because it's just too large to do in one year, okay? So you go to Chicago, north side, south side. Uh, this year they're just finishing north side, okay? Next year will be our side. Um, then the assessed values have an equalizer put on them. Become your equalized assessed value. And why does that happen? Well, because like we said before, it's supposed to be a third. It's supposed to be 33 and a third. So in order to compare Cook County properties to the rest of the state, you need to put on an equalizer in order to make sure that they are equal. And they aren't. So you put on the multiplier. Let's just get to the calculation. So here's what they do for a multiplier. They take the last three, the Illinois Department of Revenue takes the last three years and they take a look at what the actual assessments were compared to what they were supposed to be. So if you go to the second line residential, remember they're supposed to be assessed at 10% of fair market value. When they take a look at all the data that comes in, they say over the last three years the average is actually only 9.46%. If you go down even further to those commercial and industrial properties, they're supposed to be at 25, you're looking at 22 and 21. Countywide, at a weighted average, they're at 11.45% of market value. They're supposed to be 33 and a third. So how do we get to a multiplier? And you say algebra. Here we go. 11.45 times x equals 33 and a third. And then you come up with it, one multiplier, 2.9109. It was a 1.75 decrease from the 2017 multiplier. So uh, we are at 2.9627 was the 2007. Okay. It's, it's down. Now, this is what the assessed values, equalized assessed values, in Flossmoor have been doing over the last, since 2005. Um, you see, we had the housing, the market bubble, and then the crash. Everything kind of started coming down. Now, here's the interesting thing. So here we were when we got those in assessment here. Coming down here, we're going to do the Chicago. Remember I said we're assessed in three pieces. So there should not really be a whole lot of change from here to here, except for the value of the multiplier. Multiplier decreased 1.75%. Our EAV actually went down a little over 4%. There's so only one other thing that can cause a reduction in assessed valuation or equalized assessed valuation other than the multiplier. And that's something that we've been talking about a lot when we did the, the levy. Appeals. Okay? So you see we're coming down. For those appeals, if I recall correctly, you said it was almost like a record number that came out like a whole like three or four years worth. Yeah, there's there's a lot of years coming in, and there's there's finally starting to make those final determinations on them. So, bottom line is appeals is our neighbors mm -hmm. probably at least be equal. We pay more taxes. Yep. So the people who appeal are paying less. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right. So let's extend this. 
north side is being assessed right now. Assessor Katie has started a whole new way of assessing commercial and industrial properties. So we have numbers that are starting to come from the north side. It's the first time we've seen what's happening. So from the north side, the assessment in general for residential properties, the AB increase range has been between 5 and 26% increase. The increase on industrial and commercial properties, I've got a low of 67% and a high of 116%. So what does that do? So the assessment piece is the piece that tells you who's paying which piece of that one bill pie. Because remember, and we'll get to that in the next couple of slides, but we no longer do property tax bills based on the property value. We do property tax bills based on a CPI increase of the prior year's extension. So all an assessment does is tell you who's gonna pay a bigger share of that bill. So what just happened? What just happened is, on average, in North, I expect that you're going to see residential property tax bills go down between 4 and 25 percent, and the commercial properties go up between 18 and 67 percent. This is going to be huge when those bills hit, because those commercial properties are going to lose their mind. There's a lot of talk about property tax reform right now. Just keep listening. And you know, there's there's an oh, there's a town hall meeting on October 1st. I plan on being there to listen to what's going on. Uh, he's got another bill that he's trying to, to push through again with the commercial properties. It's being touted as the businesses are on board with him. I'm not sure they've seen this yet because I have a hard time believing they're going to be on board with that. None of this is this year for our taxpayers. Our taxpayers, not this year. Our turn is next year. That's why I'm watching the north side very carefully. It's our turn comes next right? year. <laughs> what you say? You may run out of town by next year. Yeah. Well, like I said, it's going to be very interesting to see and watch what happens. So that's my little go off the beaten path. Um, <laughs> so again, P-tail hit. That's where it started saying that this tax cap hit, you were gonna get CPI or 5%, whichever is higher. I haven't seen 5% in years. Um, so it altered where it goes from the value of your property to CPI. So back to the example. Remember our property was 10 and it went to 12 uh, with a $2 rate. Under PTEL, the most that you could increase is 5%. So instead of that 20% tax increase, you only get a $10 increase, you're only getting the CPI at 5%. Okay. Here's what the CPI's been doing over the last, since 1999. We've been hovering around the 2% mark. We've had these dips here. That was a fun year. I enjoyed that year. Um, but really, kind of been in the one and a half to two range. We're at 1.9% this year. We've been 2.0, 2.1 the last two years, and we'll be at 1.9 this year. Okay. So the consequence is that the rate keeps getting dropped so long as your um, property values increase. Now, what happens though when the value of the properties declines, which is exactly what happened this year, right? It went down by 4%. Your rate's going to go up because it's an inverse relationship now to the property value. So it would be the same 2.10, but over a 9,000 would increase your rate to a $2.33. Okay? But again, it's not about a rate anymore hasn't been in years. It's not about the value of the properties, it's about CPI. 
And here's where I'm going to show you. The, de the change in the EAV is in red. I'm sorry, is in blue. The change in the EAV is in blue. The change in the tax rate is in red. It's a complete in inverse re proportional reaction. Okay. So this year we see the two lines cross. Our property tax values, our property values went down. We're going to see the rate go up. But all in all, the bill is going to be 1.9% higher than the prior year. That's it. That's as much as you can get, except for new property. So any new property that comes on, you can put on a full rate. So when a piece of land goes from having nothing on it to a house, the house gets the full rate on it, that's where we get more than CPI. But that's the only place we get more than CPI. In total, in total, that doesn't mean that your bill is always going to be CPI or your neighbor's bill is always going to be CPI. Take a look at the example of what I'm telling you on the north side. Because those assessments, unless your assessments are all even across the board, then you can see CPI on your bill. But if you see one person's go up or down more than your neighbor, the entire pie just gets cut a little bit differently. Okay. So what I'm showing here, and, and you're better off looking at it on your computer later on, is that showing that this CPI, the CPI was here, and what the actual increase was year over year here was those numbers showing <coughs> proved out. You have to look at it when people say, you know, my, my bill went up more than 1.9, more than 2.1, my bill went up 15%. Yes. But what the districts took in, in total, was CPI. And that's really hard for people to understand when they're looking at a tax bill that shows more than that. That's really hard. So, with the 1.9 extension, we will levy a new property at a million dollars. We got $1.3 million of new property last year. A lot of that was still those um, properties around the mire. Um, but putting on a million just to be on the safe side, you're looking at a total cap tax. We're looking at putting on $24.5 million. And that's the same number that we brought to you in budget. It hasn't changed. Now, here's the other thing, just to extend it a little bit further. You're going to start hearing a lot talk about Property tax reform because you'll get it from the state instead in the form of the evidence-based funding model. Freeze your property tax bills and get it in EBF. Our increase in the evidence-based funding model this year is eighty-five thousand dollars. It's well, we got an increase. We got an eighty-five thousand dollar increase. Oh, increase. But if we were to freeze our levy, that's a four hundred thousand dollar loss to this district all day long. So be careful when you're starting to listen to what those proposals are. We really need to scrutinize what they need for the district. Questions? Ooh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any direction from the board as we start to move this direction? I know we, 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 we um, I hope we're limited to you, and I think it's the only decision we can make at this point. And, um, you know, we all have to talk about the taxpayer, but frankly, the reason they're happy has very little to do with us and everything to do with the state's finances, Cook County's finances. I can't wait to talk to a business owner here, too, that has already ridiculously high taxes double. But, you know, it's a problem. I mean, they're trying to bring businesses into South Cook County. Well, if that happens here, why, why would you come into Cook as opposed to going into the lower area? You're right here. So for the past couple of years, we have purposely started the comp, ran the kick off the conversation at the same time every year, but we continue to bring it back for her every board meeting to discuss until we need to vote. So you all need to decide if you feel like you need to have a continued conversation. I'm 
on a meeting by meeting basis and tell me what. So as a member of the finance committee, I do that, but if it's beneficial to more than just me, then I will go with it. But me personally, I do that. And we certainly, if board members have questions or concerns, we can take, we can send them to you at the finance committee level. Which I'll tell you say that. Yeah. So just and and say please, it. if you are want to discuss the, you know, again, the mechanics of this, go through that a little slower, so come sit with me. I have no problem with that. Right? That's there. I love this. This is fun. So, Fran, you all, um, so you foresee uh, anything that would be worth sharing with the community um, from the property tax form is going to be coming up in October. At this point, no. That we don't even know what it is. Nothing's been put out in front of us that says what it is. We're just going to keep our eye on Springfield. I, I, I saw one of our state representatives on Saturday, and I had a wonderful conversation <coughs> with her for a while. Um, just talk about all these things. There's a lot of parts in play, but it's a I mean, long way from being anything that we can present to anyone. I mean, I, I think it's good that we can at least share, and I, this is the part where I, I would kind of put to how we get the word out to the community that we did get $85,000, which is a good thing, and we secured that. Uh, that the 1.9, that's, that's a CPI. How we let the community know that there's going to be pushback and still I don't know well, that. And that. There will be. I could freeze this levy, I could reduce this levy, and I cannot promise you your tax bill won't go up. That's just what it is. That's the system that we're stuck with. Exactly. How do we get that for um, Yeah, I mean, so I don't know if in the past because we have talked about the levy on a meeting by meeting basis that, that has increased the number of people coming to the meetings during the <laughs> no. during that time. Um, and the, I mean, so we can think about other ways to communicate, you know, this information, this newsletter or something. Um, and we can maybe put it on the agenda one more time between now. Okay, well, we're going to throw it on in November after the um, the finance committee meets, just to make sure that everyone's comfortable with what you're about to, what you will, what I was put in the newspaper, and what you will vote on on December 9th after they've had a chance to, you know, have fun conversations with me. Well, the other thing I also want to say is that I know you think it needs to be silos, but we are not the only entity that is receiving money. There is a whole other district that gets way more money than we're getting. And so it becomes a bit of a, we can only account for our portion. And to your point, we can do a thousand things, but for those other parts, if they don't, it doesn't matter. So that's also something that when we try to get out to the community, it's very easy to come to this board meeting and say this, like, there are other people who are sharing with these wonderful taxes that we all can um, The prior meeting with you had given us a chart in my request of what the state has given us for the past several years. And we may ask if we would potentially that. I know that's not probably a high priority. Yeah. Um, yep. yep, yep, yep. I think that may be useful for board members to discuss with community members one of the pressures on our budget. So I think if there are any other requests or questions, then we just throw an email and it's just done. We're discussing at the finance committee level. 
update uh, with some of the um, audit adjustments that were made, and then I'll be able to put it into a podcast to get through. Okay. Do you not sound any more as
behind the norm. So there's some there's catch up that we need to do, and there's also maintenance and acceleration that we need to do for all students. So that is how we uh, we, we know we have students across the board that are falling in all three of those categories. And again, versus waiting for um, spring math, which then it's too late to make decisions, uh, to make instructional changes in the school year. Uh, taking action throughout the school year by utilizing the common formative assessment. Can you, can you like so, so why are they dropping off? Dropping off in, so this is our first data point for this school year. Um, are you saying dropping off in comparison to how they performed in the spring? Correct. Or Yeah, so there's a lot of factors that go into that. There's obviously we push the academic press that we need to do consistently and can always do better and better at that. Uh, there's some contribution of some time that happens uh, with, with students not being in school over the summer. So those factors all go into the fall score. What we try to do is really focus on what is our locus of control within a school year. So we have our students for the most part fall to spring. And so we really try to focus on uh, what can we accomplish in the school year, understanding that for some students, as we've discussed before, we need to accomplish more than a year's growth. Math asks for, sets growth targets based on a year's growth. Uh, for some students who are, for example, as my example before with our pre-reduced lunch status students in sixth grade, they're starting off, um, these students are starting off, in, at least in reading, um, below the national norm, we know that there's some additional work that we need to do. It won't be, for a student who's starting off below the norm, um, it won't be good enough for them to just make a year's growth. So that's why we do interventions, we do additional support, we are going to track the common assessment data so that we know that we're not waiting for the end of the school year to, to see. see and and part, of, part of my question is also ties back into presentation that we had in the summer regarding the opportunities that we're trying to give students to go ahead and participate mm -hmm. in some of the programs and how we're not seeming to get and so that's how I'm, I'm like that yeah. in there too the summer the lack the, 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 the lack of participation mm -hmm. the low enrollment that kind of you know, yeah. it could be, but again, you know, it depends on, also depends on what you're looking at. So if you go for one, right, so this is special ed, special education scores. You know, if you look at that Serena Hills number, you know, they're 10 points below that norm, right? And so if we talk about proficiency, we are, our, the things that we're measuring on this stuff are now 10 rip points below where the typical student is taking this assessment. And that's why we really have to keep on the growth piece. And today at this point, figure out as many touch points as we can get to provide services to those students. Because this, you know, one of the things we did talk about in our learning and instruction committee is there is no magic bullet, pill, wand, pick your metaphor that we can just wave and, and our students will hop into this intervention and all of a sudden now they don't have a reading disability. So um, it's finding as many ways as possible to engage those kids, I think, is a huge piece. But this data kind of really highlights, one, the catch-up growth that can be made over the years, uh, but also some of the deficit areas that our students start with as they're entering our system. Yeah. I mean, again, and again, and the reason for my question is, again, how can we give them a better ball to start with the year? Yeah. I think there's anything else we can do to help with that. So I think, um, well, since you, you're not allowed to ask any questions now. Um, yeah, go for you, you're um, But I think what would be helpful is if we actually also had the spring data up here so that we could actually see how, how, how big the slide or how wide the slide or what it, it is. Um, I mean, I know historically for all of my kids, they've all experienced you know, a slide. Um, so, when you, well, you know, I'll find out with this question. We can ask it. 
I just want to say also, in, instructionally at the start of the school year, we use the fall data as our, our starting point. We are aware of this great data. We, we know that data as well, but understanding that there's there's only so much we can do about the slide that happens over the summer. So we, we use it instructionally as a starting point, coupled with our um, in addition to, uh, as I mentioned, the project reports that we traditionally sent home, we are including, I have included the uh, parent, additional parent report that gives us a sense, it's really hard to see on here, but it gives each parent a sense of uh, not only as a predictor of how, based on how the student is performing right now, where they will land on the state assessment, which is new, which is really helpful to sort of connect the dots between the different assessments that we use. And also, the color coding gives parents an idea of what does this, what does your students growth mean? Are they, they growing at a rate faster than their peers, or are they growing on par with their peers? Um, what does that mean for that student? So it gives us an additional talking point with parents, and again, provides some of that additional clarity uh, for all parents that's needed to sort of make sense of what these numbers mean. And those, those are all sent all our students also participate in goal setting. Uh, and every year we've done this for a long time to help students understand uh, where they are versus where they want to be and how much they've grown, celebrating that success and identifying the opportunities for additional. And then just lastly, how we address our data is always through our school improvement plan. So as I mentioned, all of our schools have uh, intentional use of instructional data using the common form of assessments as well as using math and the state assessment data to really have a good picture of how our students are performing. We're really excited about pulling uh, that additional data piece into the dialogue around student performance because again, it's actionable, we can do things about it, and and uh, really hope to see a better progress with their students. Um, and that also goes back to teacher collaboration, which is a big piece of all of our school improvement plans, and um, not siloing ourselves into classrooms, but helping to support whether you teach reading, math, science, art, whatever it is, how can you be uh, having an impact on how students are performing. So we'll be alternating Parker, special ed, various departments over the next several months. We're going to make sure that we keep the board informed of the great work that's happening. This month it happens to be Parker Junior High. And so then next month it will be special education and we'll swing back on Parker. And again, just keeping very close tabs on the school improvement plans that we have, the commitments that we've made just as a, a district and a school. And just to closely measure and make sure we're on track. with data points, I think they will be. A lot of it will be process. You know, like, you know, we'll have, we don't have really any data right now to show that what Parker's doing is working. Right, um, so I, in, in what you mean. Right, and all right, so I, I did that, that right now, we, we, at the beginning, sure. but as we start to move into, like I said, December, <laughs> January, we'll be able to see some kind of going on. The challenge is, what do we measure? So the count on the, that common formative seat, common formative assessment sheet. Yes. Right. And then, this is our first time through. I think we'll be better, we'll be more skillful with it next year, but I think we also have other data points that we can use, at least now, to take a look at the work that's happening in the building, to figure out whether or not it's working with us an intervention piece or just the general information. Good question. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Yes, I'm going to talk about that.
Additionally, we've been working, one of our goals in our school improvement plan was to focus at the uh, special education side and our co-taught classroom has led to two teaching strategies, or two co-teaching -co models, a station teaching and parallel teaching. There's lots of different co-teaching strategies. We really wanted to get good at two of the most student-centered uh, strategies to really maximize the benefit of having more than one adult in the classroom. So we're working with our teachers on that. We're asking teachers to dip their toe in it, give it a shot, give it a try, and our coaches are providing support along the way. It takes a high level of planning and collaboration among the co-teachers to be able to use those strategies, and we done the best that we can to clear the schedule and clear the barriers, the logistical barriers um, that get in the way of that. So now the opportunity is for teachers to really take a dive into it. So early on, so what you're saying, are you saying that the co-teaching is working? And you just articulated some struggles. Yeah. How, how's, how's it going? Yeah. It, it's a work in progress. I mean, our, our teachers are definitely open to it and, and trying it. What we want to see is a stronger sense of intentionality around uh, how are we using these two strategies to make sure we're getting to every kid and maximizing that instructional time as much as possible. It requires training. It requires ongoing support. Uh, but we we are seeing progress. We <coughs> try it. Uh, it's something we need to be working on. Are they, are they getting enough training on it? I mean, do they need more? Or? They do, yeah, and that's that's what our instructional coaches are working with teachers on, utilizing our plan time. Uh, we don't need you know, two days to train on this. We can pop into a POC meeting and provide quick training for teachers, see a few examples, go try it, come back again, see some more examples, and go try it again. It's something that, that's on call. Are these also dovetailed in with uh, working with paraprofessionals and other support staff in the room? Um, yeah, it, it, it goes along with that. Yeah, so making sure that all of the adults in the room are playing a role in instruction. Okay, and when we have uh, substitute teachers come in or guest teachers come in, are they also going through some sort of orientation of expectation of what they're doing? The reason I'm asking is I've, yeah. I've been in those things as a substitute where there's been little micro power struggles, you know, mm -hmm. taking place. You know, these are things you don't want to see. Um, just to ask the question: Are we looking at um, a, trying to anticipate a lot of these uh, frustrations and, and try to mitigate those? Yeah, it's something that we're working on doing better with with our, our guest teachers. Um, we're not quite there yet. We do not have a formalized system for sort of saying guest teachers here. Other than your plans and here's where you're going, um, we haven't worked on a uh, professional development for our guest teachers, but it's definitely something that we talked about and that we can get to. Um, getting a little bit uh, back to what we discussed before, we're, we're working hard with our teachers on uh, more frequent grade monitoring and being intentional around getting communication out to parents. Uh, we've asked all of our teachers to document uh, parent communication with students who are struggling, who are in terms of grades, who have teens and youth, and just making sure that we're keeping that communication. It's not just such a case, but what are we going to do about it? And so we start to just keep track of those conversations and making sure that they're happening. In addition, uh, our, our students will always be proud of reports. Uh, we will see Bottom of their backpack, 
sitting there freaking out, right? He had no idea what he did wrong. Yeah. And won't know, you know, until everything that happened. So it's more of a systems thing, right? It's, you know, I'm sure we can get immediate access to that. <coughs> Thank you. 
it really is amazing that we get worked on considering how much we meet. But we do meet frequently with not only our local educational leaders, but also our intergovernmental groups. And as I shared in the most recent board update, we are putting together a group to work on homework policies and grading between 153, 233, 167, that's great. I have to try to come to some consensus on what that looks like. The, the, the biggest conundrum is, you know, hey, I gotta be on that grade, what does that mean? Right, there's absolutely no way to compare it. I don't know if we'll ever truly get to a point unless we go to a standard-based model. Because then it's the same. It's not a, not a level, it's not a grade. It's either you can or you can't do it. Let's worry about that special. But to the extent that you can, we're going to articulate with, with our colleagues in, in the area and figure out the best way to do it in a way that you know, provides at least consistency where we can. And we're going to start at 612. And after we get that figured out, then we'll figure out what it means for well, I thought one of the things that um, I'm getting from this feedback from the community regarding expectations and homework and consistency is that the parents are now in Hallelujah complaining children getting too much homework. And so I'm wondering if that's because there was a certain expectation before and that change in that and whether or not that is. I don't know. I don't know what they did with that. Um, and again, it's that's a good problem to have, in my opinion. Um, but I'm wondering how that ties into the game with one of them. So, uh, you know, to continue mm -hmm. consistently, I would say probably some consistent feedback, depending on where you're at and what program So, home homework is a sticky wicket that we're going to have to address, and probably that's where it gets back to that. The educational philosophy piece that we were talking about in, in policy 610. Because the research is clear on that. Everyone in this room has gone through school and they've had a certain relationship with homework throughout their educational career as students. And so that colors how we view it as parents. And a lot of perspective, while there is a lot, is that it's drastically necessary and that may not be supported by research. And so what we're going to have to is be very clear about what it means to take home learning experiences and how those can be as meaningful as possible. And then, you know, to your point about the levy, communicate that consistently and have really good expectations so that there isn't a lot of wishy-washy and this built into the system and people can know what to expect. Well, 
organization around that, so they walk the world and have smart signs and things to really celebrate the participation in school um, and show them up so that we can do what we need to do. Uh, in October, our academic and after school, our academic after school and Saturday programs will start uh, using Master's Plus, and that's part of uh, Parker's uh, Title One specific grant, which we'll talk about in a second. We did those last year as well. As I mentioned earlier, we are continuing to work on the quotation strategies. It's not something that's going to be perfect overnight, but we will not be letting go of it and continuing to utilize our instructional coaches to provide that support. From the instructional leadership side, the team and I are in classrooms every day, providing feedback to teachers every day. We're collaborating around our feedback and just as a team getting stronger in the types of feedback that we provide to teachers to help move everyone's back to school. Um, and then uh, more parent events coming up. We're planning a career day soon, uh, fine arts programs. We always have something going on with our fine arts and then our, our PTO. Um, one thing that I um, want to compliment the schools individually on, but also want to encourage greater participation in, is um, the Facebook postings. So when things are happening well and they're done Facebook, they're, they're actually getting out and they're changing some of the, the tone in the community. I think we can do more of that um, on an individual school basis. Because we, we, if, if we're doing good stuff, why not with people know what we're doing? I think we are. I, I have to say that all my moms who went, well, my moms, my mom, mom friends who have students now at Parker and Serena are just elated with the new atmosphere, I'll call it. Just it's a different atmosphere. Just they're, they're very pleased with everything. So okay, keep doing what you're doing. Awesome. Thank you. <coughs> One quick comment. Um, I think. The attendance piece is huge, and um, Beth, thank you for posting your uh, sign out for Serena. That was awesome. Actually, think the attendance piece is something that, as a district, we could actually highlight. I mean, so the same way um, students are getting excited about it at Parker, parents also got excited about seeing it posted. You know, when you did it last week. I mean, so I'd actually like to see that data from all of the schools were presented in a way that it's more of a celebration. Absolutely. So, but, you know, maybe you can start doing it. Okay, any other questions yeah. so far? Absolutely. Wait, how, I need more direction. How would you like to see it? You know, nothing, um, uh, that requires a significant amount of time or effort. I think it's sure. information that the schools are probably already collecting. Mm -hmm. Certainly, you know, part of it is celebrating it. You know, so yeah. Just okay. I, 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 to answer the question, like um, Serena's a sign, mm -hmm. very simple, but it was a celebration. Um, and whenever there are other opportunities within any of the schools, it's something simple, you know, that, but again, as I said, I, I, I am seeing and hearing when social media, they like it. Mm -hmm. Like, they want more of it, so we got more to give them, so why not give them more? What is the, you know, I'm asking, do you know the, uh, you say we're at 96%, 95%? Uh, we've been between 97 and 99%. Okay, what's what's the uh, what's the highest in Illinois? Is, there, I mean, is it better than you know middle school X? In, My guess would be that ninety seven is higher than your average school right okay. now. But again, that's maintaining that throughout the school year. So. Okay. What's your average school year? I know. What's your average? This is it. Like, parents, this is what's happening. 
And if they're late, if he turns around and says, whoops, you're late, you gotta come in, mom and dad. Like, don't just drop off the curb. Come in and own it. So, I, I yeah. I don't. Uh, right, and so the challenge then becomes as each build with their own individual focus. Sure. Kind of develops their own strategy. Sure. Yeah. Everyone is yeah. yeah. on board with the, the attendance issue, and we want to make sure that that, that is addressed by sharing my most recent update. Uh, it's important that the state is trying to figure out how to put that wow. factors in. Um, as Realistically, our chronic absenteeism numbers are lower than a lot of districts that we were put in our advance. And so we need to bring down as low as humanly possible. I think we're on the best plan for that. You know, I think the principal's heard about the sharing the attendance information and what just what that looks like. I'd like to leave it up to them how they're going to share that information and then kind of measure it. Some warnings are better than are. Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, any type of I'm asked that's the same. Well, some of the costumes are really good. Anybody seen the horn? Don't judge me. No, it's the car. I don't want it. Okay, so moving on to Title I, Title II update. We did a similar update last week. Feedback and coaching to teachers to the 
Title II, the purpose of Title II is to improve student achievement as well as improve the capacity of teachers and leaders through professional development. Um, districts uh, that receive Title II professional development funds uh, can use the money to so how are we using Title II funds? This is how we pay for portions of our ELA math and our STEM professional development, as well as some of our instructional coaching, uh, training, and capturing kids' hearts. And again, our Silver Strong administrative uh, coaching around uh, effective classroom instruction and feedback, and then various conferences that we attend. This gives you a breakdown of our allotments for Title I for the past three years. Um, we have seen a decrease over the past three years. Is that directly related to the mechanics and type of work which plus less students and all the school? Um, no, not necessarily. I, you know, I'd have to go back and look. It just the well depends on the students who are enrolled. as well. So if that number, you know, we could have more students enrolling, we reduce numbers declining, and then that number could increase. Does the 1718 uh, numbers, does that include a rollover from the previous year, or? No, I think those are just the allowances. That's just the allotment. For that year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I tried to go back just a little bit further to see what's not in the I don't know, I'm going to probably have to all this. We wanted to go back to see what those actual allotments were. As you can see, they're decreasing substantially. Yeah, you can pull that up really And then again for Title II over the past few years. And then the, the thing to know for Title II is that non public school students participate in our Title II funding. So IGP participates, sometimes Boston Montessori, various. Right, so 
this is that's, that's really an area that we have to do some work on. So there's an area of the crisis where you can self-select, just like Misha said, um, some of your skills and background abilities in the enterprises. That's an area that you can Part of the issue that you notice is there, these are scanned PDFs. We're having difficulty finding the actual digital documents. Um, so what that what that means is that eventually they're going to have to be recreated in another format that is updatable and more responsive to it. But I think it's really Preschool play based app. So really, this came from now. Um, as we talked about all of these things, our focus is on time. You know, back in kindergarten is on the math testing. Gives us back one full day of school, a full day of school in school. So let's talk about all these things. We want to make sure that we are maximizing the amount of time. Our very effective teachers are in front of our students, and this is part of that as well. So the request is that we would have three um, professionals come in. We require substitutes for our teachers. We don't substitute out our related service people um, because it's really hard to get a sub in for one day to, to handle speech therapy and to handle social work services. So when we pull to have a play-based assessment team, that team is comprised of um, an early childhood teacher. And when you move to the IEP meeting, we had a general education early childhood teacher as well. Our special education early childhood teachers have both credentials. Um, so we're able to use one person. The people that I will seek out to fill that role will also have both credentials. So that we can have one person fill two roles. And then we are looking for a social worker, and we are also looking for a speech language pathologist. We pull our teachers for two um, events. One is preschool screenings, which is our early our child find obligation. And then the second reason we pull them is for students that come from preschool screening that really, based on our preschool screening, have many more needs that we really need to further evaluate. We move them to a play based assessment, and essentially a special education assessment. We also have students that come to us from early intervention. And those students um, do not participate in our preschool screening for the most part. They go right to a play-based assessment based on the reports we get from early intervention. Um, we have read some reports and placed the child in special education based on the report. It's called a file review. The problem is that most of the reports are out of date and we are under very specific time constraints. Just like in special education, the time constraints are even more so because we don't have the information with a lot of longevity and we have to have a transition meeting coming out of uh, preschools, uh, excuse me, coming out of early intervention and then we also have to meet and have them stacked and given the opportunity to start on their birthday. So we have, it, it's, it tends to be a quick turnaround. Um, we also have, there's a new law um, that says that we have to provide parents with the special education documents three days ahead. So we've had to change our traditional practice, which was having the assessment in the morning and the, and the um, evaluation meeting in the afternoon. And we can't do that any longer because we have to provide them with the documents. So we've had to switch a few things up. But having these three staff members um, come in would, keep teachers in their classrooms and keep the related service providers in their classrooms. It, it will make, a, 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 I think, a tremendous difference. Are there any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Can I go back to the other question? Did I get sure. something that you said there? there? I didn't see scan documents. They're all, like, nice. Mm -hmm. They were so so I want to know if I'm missing. No, there are, there are some pieces. No, they're not. I opened them all twice, and they're all beautifully laid out. Mm -hmm. Oh, just Are you talking about it? Right. Um, they're all PDFs. They're all PDFs. Yeah, yeah. I only saw PDFs. I opened no, no, each one right. twice. I just no, no, right. I saw these going on. This is Heather Bill. Serena Hill. Your scroll. Yeah. Yeah. 
question. Went all the way down. Sure. That, that is very hard. That is very hard. Right, we oh, this is scan? Yes. Uh -huh. okay. and, and we have some original scan videos. We just don't have the ones that we can change. Oh. So it's trying to get the kind of that you're talking about. Yeah, those okay. specifically. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Now I understand. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm sorry. Okay. Who is the author? I'm not sure about the original authors. I mean, a lot, a lot of it looks like the NIMS National Management Training. Yeah, that's what I think. So that it might have been. And it was a crisis even years ago that Bruce Brzezinski did. I was going to say, it's Bruce Brzezinski. Bruce Brzezinski and a team like worked on it, and that. I think Mike Stavola worked on it too. Do you remember Mike? Yeah, yeah. Was Bruce, oh, Mike. Is there Mike? If I remember, it was. Bruce, Mike, and Timmy Otis, and thanks to Aaron. Yeah. So I love how you guys we went through the lot, lots of names that we had to get out. Right? We haven't seen that person in 10. So it should not be our evacuation coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, just, I just giving up those little pieces. Yes. Yeah, that's evacuation. Okay, we're going to keep moving. Yep. Yep. And you subscription tracking. Bringing this back to the board, if there are any questions about our annual subscriptions, we try to break it down by department so everyone had an idea of what that looked like. We spent about half a million dollars a year on software tolls. I appreciate you pulling this together on your request. Um, I don't have any immediate questions, I think, but I think this will be a useful tool maybe um, next spring we should be looking at software. Oh, 100%. And, you know, it, it was a little bit tedious. What's the end of your sentence? We should be looking at the um, part that we're spending on software. <laughs> yeah, um, Courtney, would you mind to me? And just a little bit, not to really good point. It just hit on learning and instruction. But to Cam's point, if you look at all of those different pieces, now this is learning instruction. This is our biggest chunk. Learning and instruction accounts for about $300,000 in click charge. Now, you know the ready jack and my perspectives and all of those different things. You know, the, the per student cost is just a built in cost of doing business in the past. It was this, you know, $65 textbook over, you know, five years is actually 10 You know what I mean? So the, the cost is still there. One of my pet peeves with any of these vendors is when they say we have a great deal, it's just an annual charge. And that drives me mental because it's not just an annual charge, it's something that accumulates. And at some point, if you're not on top of it, you know, it can get out of hand. We are looking at this and tying it all together. Part of the MTSS report and recommendations going through our interventions and making sure that the ones that we're using and paying for are the best ones. So here's where we're going to catch us. Thank you.